Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Julia and I make video essays mainly about TV series and films, but also on pop culture and sometimes politics like today. Well, Biden is the new president-elect of the United States of America. Good news, right? Three things we need to consider. One, the blue wave didn't happen. Everyone expected, as they did in 2016, a fast and major win. But the election was close, too close for comfort. Two, Donald Trump may not have won the popular vote, but he did netted more voters in 2020 than he did in 2016, with over 17 million Americans that still want him in office. Three, some people voted for Biden simply because they wanted to get rid of Trump not because there was an efficient democratic alternative. In fact, win or lose, Trumpism still dominates conversation around the country. And all of this, despite the mismanaged pandemic, an intensified economic and racial crisis, and Trump saying many things that would have been just political suicide for any other candidate. And almost every time this happened, um, political analysts on both sides of the spectrum anticipated that he'd lose supporters because of it. But as we've seen in this past year, they were dead wrong every single time. How is all of this possible? Well, a very wrong assumption is for Trump supporters to be all the same. At worst, politics and media portrayed Trump supporters as utterly idiotic. At best, they landed on a discourse that is typically exemplified in the Dunning-Kruger effect, according to which the problem isn't just that people are misinformed, it's that they're completely unaware that they're misinformed. Hence, the leftist continuous and unsuccessful tries to reach this group of people through expert opinions, logical arguments, and factual evidence. Yet we have seen over and over again that whatever lie is discredited, whatever facts are presented, his supporters support the lie and ignore the logic. Perhaps then we were mistaken? Indeed, statistics tell us that Trump's base is a diverse alliance that is not a homogeneous group despite media generalizations. However, it is indeed true that Trump supporters tend to be on the conservative spectrum. Right after World War II, the researchers observed a close correlation between the holding of conservative system-justifying values and authoritarian tendencies. They took a multi-methods approach and noticed that people that supported statements like, America may not be perfect, but the American way has brought us about as close as human beings can get to a perfect society, were also more likely to express prejudice, anti-Semitism, and general anti-democratic feelings. Conversely, though found amongst liberals as well, these were much less likely to display authoritarian tendencies. Authoritarianism is a syndrome, the effects of which are surprisingly consistent around the globe, and they are characterized by 1. Submission to authority 2. A rigidly hierarchical view of the world 3. Resistance to new experiences and 4 aggression towards outgroups. Trump's speeches filled with absolutist terms such as loser and complete disasters are classic authoritarian statements. The clear divergence between groups on top of society, whites in group, and those losers and bad hombres on the bottom, immigrants, black, Latinos, the outgroups, are classic social dominance remarks. Not surprisingly, recent work discovered that Trump supporters tend to score especially high on authoritarianism. Just before the elections in 2016, McWilliams found that high authoritarians were in strong favor of Trump and correctly predicted that because of it, election surveys were strongly underestimating Trump's support. During the presidential primaries in 2016, Feldman also found a significant correlation between authoritarianism and positive views of Trump. Indeed, none of the evaluation of any other primary candidate revealed 
such a connection. Steiner's theory of activation, according to which many authoritarians may be latent, meaning that these individuals may not necessarily support authoritarian leaders until their authoritarianism has been activated. He explains how previously more moderate voters would now come to support leaders and policies which we may now call Trumpesque in such large numbers and so rapidly. These tendencies can be uh, triggered by the perception of physical threats or by changes in the social order, leading those individuals to look out for leaders and policies on the authoritarian spectrum. And that's how aggressiveness is seen so much more as a strength than as a weakness, and why Trump has spent so much time convincing his base he's tough and powerful. Mike Tyson endorsed me, I love it. When I get endorsed by the tough ones, I like it. Because you know what? We need toughness now. We need toughness. Challenges to the traditional order are then perceived as personally threatened because they may overturn the status quo, which these individuals equate with basic security. With America becoming more diverse, it means that many white Americans are now confronting race in a way that they never had to do before. The ever-evolving social norms, such as the uh, progressive erosion of traditional gender norms or ethical advancements into how we discuss sexual orientation, even in popular culture. How often do we hear someone, usually on the right, um, say something like, today's entertainment is so politicized, although it had been happening gradually for a very long time. Only recently they have become more obvious and difficult to ignore. And these are coinciding with economic trends that have also diminished the labor power of working class white people. And that's also why Trump spent so much time associating terms like socialist or radicalized left to Democrats like Biden, which let's be honest is more in common with a moderate Republican that he has with an actual socialist, further threatening the rise of this supposed socialism that aims to enslave America, its traditional values, and its freedom. Literally comparing the left to a horror tale of greed. <clears throat> Come on, man! Candy's for the kids. Well, maybe he forgot. Wait a minute. You, you look familiar. Who are you? Are we gonna let her get away with this? She took everything. The social threat theory then helps explain that people do not support extreme policies and leaders just out of a conscious aspiration to authoritarianism, but rather as a response to certain kinds of threats to overthrow scary changes if necessary by force in order to maintain the status quo. Then add all of these changes to the fact that the previous president was a black man and that Republican politicians and the media such as Fox News spent the past years telling viewers that the world was becoming a dangerous, dangerous place. The Manchurian candidate couldn't destroy us faster. They're marching us towards 1984. I mean, this guy is such a total pussy. He wants to transform exceptional private enterprise America into neo-socialist Europe. When are we gonna wake up and start fighting the fascism? They're the enemy. Who has a deep-seated hatred for white people. Why wouldn't we impeach this president for not protecting and defending Americans? A fist bump, a pound, a terrorist fist jab? Our country's less, less safe today. He believes the bad guys are the American people. We have a president who is aligned with the Jihad force. Barack Obama's emotional attachment to the Muslim world has hurt the USA. Of course, some Trump supporters are downright racist, misogynistic, etc. Yet, what is important to understand here is that authoritarianism is not a political preference, but rather a personality profile. And as such, authoritarians are a class that exists regardless of Trump and will remain as a force in American politics. So these insights add up to a real scary possibility that if social changes and physical threats coincide at the same time, 
let's say in 2024, could awaken a potentially enormous population of American authoritarians who will pretend the despotic leaders and the extreme policies necessary to respond to the rising dangers. And since obviously authoritarian tendencies are triggered by uh, fear and threats, when you think you found your protector, you become less bothered with the rhetoric that would normally be seen as offensive. Trump played on and exacerbated these fears not just through his speeches, but also in more subtle ways. For example, at Trump rallies, uh, people were told not to approach any potential protester, but rather to alert security by chanting Trump, 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 despite being often a false alarm, through the repeated cry for the leader, signaling the possibility of enemies amongst their group, and while observing others doing the same thing. People were continuously reinforced who think as if they were under threat. So rather than focusing on the authoritarian himself, the politician Trump, we really should start trying to address the psychological profile of people who, under the right circumstances, would respond favorably to someone like him. This is not something that has been happening in America alone, indeed all over the world and in Europe too. We are witnessing the rebirth of right-wing populist movements that thrive under conditions of anxiety. In this regard, this form of rhetoric glorifies the fact that whatever country, in this case America, has an exceptional mission in the world that is falling behind and therefore needs to change in order to fulfill its original vision. Trump communicated to his base how these feelings are based on one an issue of power and wealth rather than of moral purpose, which has been instead the democratic message. And the two, they are due to the greed of others, both external, like for example China and Mexico, who stole the jobs of ordinary Americans, but also internal like Obama and Clinton and the political class as a whole. Why do you think the pandemic mishandling didn't cause much trouble to Trump? So many people died from COVID-19, yet this wasn't even a relevant theme for uh, people voting for Trump in 2020. Calling it from the offset the Chinese virus, the same country which Trump had previously convinced part of America which was responsible for the loss of their jobs, framed the whole pandemic in a way that didn't make people focus on the healthcare problematics, so much discussed by the Democratic Party, but rather to reinforce the fact that, I've told you before, we need to eliminate the danger of the external threats. The third part identified Trump as the solution. Throughout his speeches, Trump insisted that he's not like other politicians because he's not a politician at all. In this sense, Clinton's 2016 uh, nomination is the worst the Democratic Party could have chosen because it did reinforce the view that the Democrats are part of an elite, part of a dynasty. So compared to classical politicians, Trump is a businessman, a successful businessman that knows how to make a deal. If you can't make a good deal with a politician, then there's something wrong with you. You're certainly not very good. We need a leader that wrote the art of the deal. Our president doesn't have a clue. He's a bad negotiator. We have all the cards, but we don't know how to use them. We don't even know that we have the cards because our leaders don't understand the game. By being so successful and rich, this means he cannot be bought. This is why his wealth acts in his favor instead of against him. Than Trump's constant violations of political etiquette, so often seen as indicators of his immediate fall, actually 
serve to cement his rise. His rejection by the political class fortified his outsider status in the eyes of an anti-establishment group. As a consequence, Trump positioned himself as the only one capable and willing to unite together with ordinary Americans to restore what America has lost. And this not only responds to the paradox at the heart of the Trump phenomenon that The Guardian has put forward, meaning how can a billionaire businessman from New York be the one who gets the struggling working class? But also lets us understand that seeing this way, Trump's message was actually one of hope. Because despite typical generalizations, it has been estimated that the median annual income of Trump supporter was a solid $72,000. The most of his base were living or working in postal areas where employment in manufacturing had been declining since 1990. And the low mobility areas where Trump performed better are those where children are having difficulties in reaching the same status of their parents. So it's not really the economic stupid, not in the sense of absolute deprivation, but rather in that of relative deprivation. Basically, half of the population feels so relatively deprived to what they expected to possess at this point in their life and relative to what they mistakenly perceives others less deserving so have gained. Thus, Trump adherents are not economically destitute, but they are, as Thomas Edsel phrased it, falling behind the Joneses. Democratic politicians need to remember that the target group with their interactions with liberal parties are not the authoritarian themselves, but their more moderate supporters. Supporters that not may even be Republican to begin with, which is the exact opposite of what the Democratic Party did in 2016 and again in 2020. In particular, the effective use of language and rhetoric is key to a successful response strategy. The aim here is to diffuse the authoritarian latency through a more moderate communication because priming political correctness norms actually causes more support in folks like Trump. Indeed, another huge important part of the levels of support for Trump were the consequence of the salience of restrictive communication norms. Basically, academics suggest that the move towards a more political correct society in both its language and communicative form, while it does generate short-term conformity, it simultaneously prepares for, the, for a consequent downfall. It makes people feel bad about the norm emotionally and it cognitively corrupts the informational value that the norm otherwise might have produced. Turns out that all the effort that we make on a daily basis to try and educate people by using different or more inclusive terms and removing negative group related language is incredibly counterproductive. Indeed, how many of us thought, you know, a few years ago people shy away from even looking like a racist and now they're saying it outright. That's because research suggests that over salience in PC norms actually undermine its positive goal and produce more negative communication in the long term. That's why it's not a liability for Trump to call Mexicans rapists or to speak about massacring Muslims. He is sending a signal to his authoritarian base that he won't let political correctness holding him back from attacking the outgroups that they fear. I think the big problem this country has is being politically correct. I've been, ch <laughs> I've been challenged by so many people and I don't frankly have time for total political correctness. And to be honest with you, this country doesn't have time either. This country is in big trouble. We don't win anymore. We lose to China. We lose to Mexico, both in trade and at the border. We lose to everybody. And this is not just my theory. Research has confirmed it by indicating that individuals that felt protracted uh, uh, reluctance to PC norms, regardless of their political ideology, were very much pro-Trump. And not only that, but they were even more likely to respond to his priming of no bullshit, no political correctness, and deepen their support. So based on all of this, my first suggestion would be to stop labeling so much. Stop using specific terms which are now ingrained in PC culture. This is not a suggestion to not care, okay? This is strategic measure for the problem at hand, a 
political communicative one. Trump too used the label. When he calls Hillary crooked or Joe Biden sleepy or the media, the mainstream media, they seem stupid. They make us chuckle, right? We think, look at this idiot. But what he's actually doing, he's doing the exact opposite of applying restrictive communication norms. They're not just nicknames. Basically, they are the quintessential negation of PC culture. Research also suggests that the acceptance and rejection to terms that signify the importance of environmental issues vary greatly amongst Republicans, but not amongst Democrats. Meaning that regardless of the questions that they ask, uh, wording something so simple can influence greatly such a huge part of the population. Just consider this. A majority of Republicans reported high belief, belief, let's go, in climate change, about 60.2%, while only a minority reported high belief in the term global warming, about 44%. So there is a 20% difference according to the term you use to how Republicans will believe or react on environmental issues. And even on another research, climate disruption uh, promotes the highest levels of concern, while climate crisis promotes the lowest amongst all of these that I mentioned, climate crisis. And so obviously I checked on Twitter and well, you can see for yourself that basically um, the typical wording, the typical terms used is in fact, so yes, you guessed it, climate crisis. So as Democrats, nothing changes for us, right? We still believe in it, whatever word you use, because we believe in science. So that if a Democrat makes a speech without using trigger words, we still understand and appreciate what he's talking about. But at the same time, we're not adding others who may not be as receptive, disengaging from the message. And so more sneaky tactics wouldn't hurt either. Instead of trying to take the high ground on freaking everything. For example, during and after these elections, as an attempt to stop the spreading of fake news, social media, namely Twitter, has um, restricted the access to tweets that fail to meet the standards. Trump's feed was constantly being limited because of this. To us, that's proof that, of course, Trump is lying. To authoritarians, that's proof that their great leader is being censored by the powers to be, because he's indeed speaking the truth. Why not purposely tweet something that would get the same treatment from Twitter, from Biden or Kamala as well. Not by tweeting lies, of course, but by exploiting the gray lines of Twitter false claim uh, limitations so that the whole argument of the powers to be trying to censor and limit the freedom of only one of the two candidates would be moot. The strategy here is to avoid being maneuvered into a trap that makes martyrs out of extremists. The usual response to um, stop these authoritarian tendencies has been the one to stop othering the others, trying to be more open and conciliatory and understanding. But the truth is that the Democrats learned culture of helplessness is powerless against authoritarians. Calling out hypocrisy with an outraged tone is a pointless shaming mechanism for a party or a group of people that has no shame anymore. And begging for bipartisanship at every turn holds the fight to truly implement progressive policies. This unfortunately seems to be, to have been um, Biden's strategy as well so far. That of calming the tones of being the president of everybody. However, it definitely doesn't modify or not even addresses the changes that have been activated in authoritarians and that may pose a risk for the future. By gradually abandoning its traditional base and class commitments over the last, let's say, 40 years, Democrats made the conscious choice to turn their backs to their historical commitment to unions and workers and simply adopted a more nuanced version of what the Republicans were selling. As James Kwan observes, the Republican line was simply markets good, government bad. And the Democratic comeback was 
markets are generally good, but government should correct for identified market failures. So by adopting this line, uh, Democrats not only didn't offer a differentiated message, but grew indifferent to the growing inequality in America. So much so that many Afro-Americans, many Latinos, in general many minorities, ethnic and racial minorities, didn't vote for them. And this despite Trump's racist rhetoric, confirming that the focus on social identity issues alone wasn't enough. Another typical move of the Democratic Party has been that of focusing on education as a way to give children a more jobs, more perspectives and possibilities in the future. All of the most relevant, most important Democrat figures, Democratic figures in, the re in recent years narrate the story through their uh, educational achievements. So much so that I think they actually started to believe that the only thing that differentiated their success uh, towards the ordinary um, working class in America was they, they went to college and got degrees and masters. And a good education equals a good job. But again, James Quark observes that if the problem was that works, workers weren't educated enough, weren't smart enough, productivity would not be going up, by the way, by 94% since 1990. This is not a problem of education, but rather a problem of power. Yes, I agree, it's absolutely ridiculous for young people to uh, have all of those, all of that debt uh, when going to college. But the reason why people don't feel like they should, they have what they should have at this point in their life is not because they're not educated enough or because they are unskilled. It's because their employers have all the market power. This caused the emergence of what economist Thomas Piketty in Capital and Ideology calls a multiple elite party system in which basically the left has become the party of the intellectual elite while the right can be viewed as the party of the business elite. This means that despite what Trumpism may suggest, today's left is far away as possible from socialism. Indeed, I don't think it's not even left, I think it's moderate centrism. David Graeber explained that very well when he talked about how the left has been reduced to a poor set of performative symbols that allows it to be to appear as morally superior to others, while at the same time approving a sort of symbiosis with conservatives. It becomes a bit of a good cop, bad cop routine where those two are the only two viable choices that feed off and complement each other. And the cherry on top is that the Democrats have convinced us that we need to compromise. Just think of the fact that Obama spent months trying to have at least a couple of Republicans sign on his Obamacare proposal uh, so that he could say it was uh, bipartisan. We need to be better then because we're liberal and that's what liberals are all about. But the truth is, while we may accept a conservative's idea, we don't consider it equally valuable. And as such, we end up always in the middle, scared to go forward and achieve any real progressive goal and pushed back by our own tolerance. The anger towards free trade and globalization has largely taken the Democrats by surprise, causing us to unwittingly become championing globalists and failing to find viable alternatives to protectionism and wars. Basically, only one in five Americans think that youth today will have a better life than their parents' generation. And whether that's in terms of absolute or relative deprivation, it feels like Democrats' response has been And when they went to the Queen to tell her her subject had no bread, do you know what she said? Let them eat cake. That's why the most powerful force in America today continues to be an anti-establishment anger at what feels to be a rigged system. And that's why I believe Democrats cannot beat authoritarian populism without an agenda of radical democratic reform and serious progressive policies communicated through an anti-establishment movement. My generation, millennials, understood this more than others. Despite uh, the advanced degrees, the education. We saw the work hard and we, you will succeed dream vanish before our eyes. And we have lost patience for those uh, politicians 
keeping company with those in power, that the ideal of achieving a middle class lifestyle is completely off the table for us. And this is how this type of anger is not confined to the right. It did fuel the rise of people like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. The model that Democrats have been following in modern years have been an utter failure. In the capital of capitalism, a country without an actual left, still living off the scare of the Soviet Union, will never achieve a true change. And therefore, there will be no other choice than to fall back to its colonial roots. Right now, the Democratic Party risks celebrating Trump's loss and moving on. The ideal set up for a talented, less abrasive authoritarian to sweep into office in 2024. Republicans will use Trumpism as a blueprint for their next candidate. Surely a smarter political figure, and it won't be easy to make the next one a one-term president. That's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed. Let me know in the comments below uh, what you think of my theories and my proposed suggestions and what do you think is the state of American politics as of today. And as usual, if you enjoyed these videos and would like to see more from me, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell button for notifications. See you next time. Bye.